These are the spiles or maple taps that we're going to be using today to tap the trees. And we've set aside 50 here and that's our goal. We're going to get 50 trees set up and tapped today. Now each of these spiles is going to get banged into a hole that we'll drill using that drill bit. That'll get knocked into the tree with a hammer, but behind it will be this hook. The bucket will hang on that and the lid will go over and be pinned in through that opening. Now, last year, I was using a spile like this one. And you can see these have about the same diameter. These are 5 16 spiles. I really like these because they do minimal damage to the tree. In the past, people were using much bigger spiles. A lot of people are still using bigger spiles. So I'm going to just show you these as a comparison. That's a real common old school style spile. And you can see how much more damage that's going to do to the tree just due to the nature of how big around that is, that circumference of that. Here's another example, and you can see this one has a built-in hook, which is kind of nice, uh, but you've got a, still a very thick tap there, and it has this little channel that the sap would run down. It's a cool setup, but it's still going to do a lot more damage to the trees. I have young trees here. They're not very big in their circumference, so I want to minimize the damage that I'm doing to these trees so that they can heal more rapidly, and I reduce the likelihood of introducing some kind of infection to that tree. It's helpful if you can keep the drill attached to your body, at least have some kind of holster for it. Here you can see I've just dummy corded it to my pants and that way it's right there. I don't have to take it on and off each time so I can just drill those trees. Because carrying all this gear, man, it's a lot of stuff to load out. So I've got my hammer right there just on a little hammer loop. But my pants have this nice kind of, if I need to, I can just stick them there too. But having some way to carry that hammer, that's what we're banging those spiles in with, so that's really important. I like to keep a pair of snips close by just because these are not well-maintained trails as you can see and it's just always there's new stuff, new growth or stuff that's fallen, so being able to clip stuff. Plus each time I hang the buckets I gotta move around the tree, so sometimes I need to clear new branches and things like that. Here's where I've got all of my spiles and hooks and I've got those in a separate bag since we had sterilized those earlier and then in this back pocket I'm carrying the uh, little strut that holds the lid to the bucket itself. And then of course Ivani's carrying all those buckets and lids in that pack basket. So that allows us to have everything handy and I can get pretty efficient and do this job much more quickly than if I was sort of trying to manage all these parts in my arms or carry everything in a pack or something like that. So everything's right there on my belt and I can do all the different operations pretty efficiently. Well, now we're going to go walk the sugar bush and gather the sap for the day. I'm, I'm hoping there's a substantial amount to gather. I'm not expecting there to be that much. Anyway, everything we gather together in our buckets, we're going to pour through this strainer and we'll see what we get today. And hopefully we can at least fill one of these big tins. This has consistently been my best tree this year. It's always exciting to get over here and see what we get. Yeah, this one's just about... It's about three quarters of the way full, a little more maybe. The science of what's making this happen is so bizarre. It's not really what you'd think. You'd, you'd kind of picture that sap's being drawn up through the roots and just pours out of the holes that we make when we drill in and put that spile in. But what's actually going on is sap is always moving up through this tree. And when the nights get down to freezing temperatures, there's gases inside there that actually contract and freeze up. And then the next day when things warm up, those gases expand and that creates pressure inside the tree. And that actually forces fluids out. So on days when we're not getting good sap flow, that doesn't mean the tree's not getting good sap flow. It means that we don't have those expanding gases creating high pressure inside the tree that forces the sap out. So when we see this drip like that, what's actually going on is there's pressure in there from expanding air, expanding gases, forcing it in the area that it can escape, where that pressure can escape is through our spile. And that's what's happening now. So this container is 40 liters. And on average, you're getting something like one liter of syrup 
to 40 liters of sap. So every time I fill one of these, I think, okay, that's about one more quart or one more liter of syrup. Now, earlier in the season, when the sugar content's higher, I might get a little bit more than that. Um, or it depends a little bit on the species too. So, you know, I harvest mostly red maples, but my sugar maples, you know, are gonna have a higher sugar content. But on average, I might get uh, a liter to a liter and a half of finished syrup out of one of these containers. So it looks like a lot of sap, but the amount of sugar that's in there is pretty diffuse. Well, that's full now. And given how much work it took to fill this, and that that's gonna boil down to about one quart of maple syrup, one mason jar full, you can really begin to understand why maple syrup is so expensive. I've got these two 10 gallon or 40 liter milk containers here, stainless steel milk containers. This is all the sap I gathered yesterday and it just filled these. You can see they're filled right to the brim. We're just going to be steaming off as much of that water as we can and as it steams, cooks off, we're just going to be concentrating those sugars. Now keep in mind that the sugar itself is not that dark color of the syrup. That's the caramelization that's happening from the cooking process. So as that cooks down, we'll see it darken as well and start to take on that color that we think of being associated with maple syrup. Um, I'll keep adding more sap to it as well and we'll keep cooking it all down because we've got a second big 40 liter container of sap today as well. When you're cooking down your maple sap into maple syrup, it's important you get the right ratio of sugar to water. Um, if you cook it down too far, you're gonna end up forming a lot of crystals in the bottom. You're gonna lose some of that maple syrup to sugar crystallization. But if you leave too much water in there, what you're gonna end up with is something that can mold. So we need some kind of way to determine that we have the right ratio. Now there is a way using a thermometer, but what I'm gonna be doing here is using a hydrometer. This device here allows me to get a really accurate reading. And once it floats in the sap or in the syrup to this hot fill line, I know I have perfect maple syrup. So I like using this a lot. All right, I think we're there. Even on a low heat, we're getting those high bubbles like that. Yes. That's it. Perfect. I'm going to fill those right up to the neck. And then once I place a lid on them, I place the cap like that. I'm going to screw that down top and just flip it over. <clears throat> That's going to sterilize the lid. And the heat from this sap is already sterilizing the jar. And so we don't have to reboil these the way you would with a normal canning process. And I like that a lot. Well, we've got 25 quarts of maple syrup finished for 2019, and that feels really good. It started off a really slow season, and right at the end it picked up. So the last week, we got good hard freezes at night, warm days, and the sap really ran. So we were able to complete all this. It's not as much as I made last year. So last year I made eight gallons. This year we're at 6.25 gallons, but it's enough to get through the year. So. I've got the syrup that I need and we're going to have a little bit left over because we still got two gallons from last year too. So all in all, we're still running a surplus and it was a great year. I learned a lot actually following along with, you know, each year you learn a little bit more by watching what the trees do and how they respond to the weather. And so even though I didn't get as much sap as I'd hoped, it helped me to really understand it a lot better. So um, all in all, this has been a fantastic season and now it's time to put all this in the stores and uh, start working it down bottle by bottle.